Hello and welcome to another episode of Tales from a Professional Nerd. My name is Brian C.P. Steele and I will be your nerd today and any other day that you watch one of my silly little shows. Hi everybody, how, how are y'all doing? Okay, now that we've gotten that out of the way, uh, let's jump into the week in Brian. Um, so let's see, personally, uh, Diet and Jim has been doing just fine. I've had a couple of, a uh, couple of slip days where, you know, obviously Thanksgiving was around and then, uh, as work stress and stuff starts to peak, uh, sometimes it's easier to just grab food instead of having to actually cook and make it. Um, but overall, uh, I haven't like backslid as far as weight loss goes. I'm still sitting at right, right around 30, 31, 32 pounds, give or take, depending on, you know, water loss and whatever. Um, so I'm still working, moving in the right direction. So, uh, no, no, nothing bad there. Um, here in a couple of days, my, uh, my son turns 15, um, which blows me away. Uh, I, I always see videos and pictures and things from when he was little and, uh, uh, just, it's, I remember, I remember when I was 15, like that, that was a, you know, when someone, when someone says, uh, what do you, uh, what do you, what, you know, when you imagine you as a kid and I, I want to say like right around like fifth, like 14 and 15 is, is when, like when I, I picture myself the most kid, um, I mean, like, it's it's possible... Yeah, you know, I remember when I was littler, I remember playing with toys and, and that kind of stuff. But, like, when I, th when I think of, um, kind of my my younger heydays, uh, like, 14 through 16 is, is that time period. So seeing Connor in that, uh, in that, that area and seeing him come into his own and, you know, hang out with his friends and, and, you know, go do things with girls and it's, it's... It's like, I, you know, uh, it's hard to say, but like, this is my first trip being a parent. Yeah, obviously my first, my first parenting down the way. And I see these things and I know, I know why parents do what they do. If that makes any sense whatsoever. I know I'm, I'm waxing philosophical this morning. Um, Let's see. So that's the personal stuff. We'll set that outside. Um, gaming wise, uh, I got to um, I got to go play a couple of board games over at my my friend's house this last weekend. Um, we played uh, what is it? Fallen Lands Descendants, I think, is what it's called. Uh, it's a post apocalyptic America, very very uh, pop culture Fallout inspired um, board game that. Uh, we, we had to have one, uh, one false start. Like we played, like we got like halfway through the first round and someone drew a card that basically would have, uh, ended the game for like three players. Um, from a game designer standpoint, I get it. It's cool. It's fun. It's a one in a, one in a million chance that these might happen. And then the, our dice fell badly and, and whatnot. Uh, but it, it, it. I look at something like that and I go, they could have done this. You know, it, 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 one or two additional lines on that card would have made it still absolutely horrible, but at least playable. Um, so we, 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 we went through it, realized that it would completely ruin the game that took us an hour and a half to set up. Uh, and so we threw it out and kept playing. Uh, we had a good time. Uh, it, it came down to, we started to realize that it was going to be a much longer game than what we had time for based off of everyone who was traveling. Uh, so we used the short version. Uh, basically, it's a game that you are racing to either your town being a certain size or you have a certain prestige. And then there are two values. There is the uh, the full value, like if you're playing a full game, and then there's the shortened version if you want to play a short game. So about three or four rounds into the game, uh, we, which rounds take a long time, there's a lot in each round, um, we, uh, we decided we're going to, you know, like, let's go ahead and just do the short game, and uh, uh, my buddy Matt won, which was fun. That was, that was, that was a good time. Um, it's, it's got a really, I, I think it's got a really cool mechanic. Like, it's a really well-designed well, well -designed game. 
Um, I just think that in their search for making it thematic, they may have forgotten that sometimes, uh, sometimes you don't want to have someone who's been playing for three hours to restart because of a bad die roll. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, and then that, that same day, uh, when we wrapped up with that game, we cleaned everything up and we were like, well, we still have a couple hours. Do you want to, you know, play something else? Uh, we went ahead and ripped out the Dice Throne. Uh, Dice Throne is such a goofy, fun, like it's, it's, it's such a, a, a low stress game. Um, that it is the kind of thing that you can just kind of bring out. Uh, now we did not mix in any of the Marvel stuff. Um, not because we don't like Marvel, but because there's a different, there's a couple of different mechanics that they added to the Marvel characters that while they are, um, compatible with regular Dice Throne characters, those extra oomph that the, that the way that their uh, characters are written, the Marvel Dice Throne is just a little bit more powerful than the regular, than the regular Dice Throne set. Um, so we, we chose not to use that. Uh, I know that they're making an X-Men one, and when that comes out, we'll probably play one where every pl everybody plays Marvel characters. Um, and then, obviously, everybody on the same footing will have a great time. Um, but yeah, so, this is, so that was my Sunday, or my, my, my weekend. Uh, and then it's just been a lot of work. Work, 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 work. Um, I did get some painting done. I needed, I needed to just... I needed to just get out of my head. I was having a rough day and I was like, you know what? Painting is one of the ways I do it. So I sat down and I finished up the those battle mechs that have been sitting there waiting for me for, for months. Uh, and then I jumped in on something as a way to inspire me to want to play more of the game. And uh, I painted up the my three steel forged. Here's a sample of one of them. Grr, from Conquest. Uh, so my steel forged are done. Uh, you can tell I got a little bit of primer on my knuckles from priming some stuff last night. Um, but uh, yeah, so my steel forged are done. Uh, I wanted to show you one of those. And then um, as of this morning, the sealant is drying on my Inferno, Inferno Automata. Um, and then, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll jump jump in and uh, get you know kind of keep that stuff uh, moving. Although I did realize I only have like maybe like three or four more battle mechs in my BattleTech co current collection to paint, and then I'll be fully painted um, before the Mercenaries Kickstarter stuff shows up. So we'll see. I may, I may take a break uh, and get those slammed out so I can say I've got a fully painted collection, which uh, you know. Would, what the heck? Um, and then, uh, yes, that's that's all my painting. Um, work has been crazy. Uh, work has been nuts. Uh, between getting stuff uh, finished out and finalized with existing projects and Kickstarter projects, and uh, I wrote an essay for, uh, for... Hang on, I got something in my eyeball. Um, I wrote an essay for... Uh, uh, for a company who's going to put it in a, a, a novel about game industry professionals. Um, this is not a novel. It'd just be a book. <laughs> not all books are novels. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, it's it's been crazy. Um, I, I The wheels have begun on a project that uh, will come to fruition next year. Um we, uh, I got, um, I got my, a lot of stuff planned to start working on in the next few, uh, my next week I am, I am swamped next week with, uh, management, like, like business planning and stuff. Part of it is we're getting to the end of the year and, uh, everyone evil genius, we're going to take a, take a couple of weeks off for the holidays. But we have a lot of stuff that needs to get kind of wrapped up and set aside and done and you know wrapped in a bow before we can really walk away. And so there's a, the next couple of weeks are going to be a lot of uh, a lot of work. Um, and then uh, uh, speaking of a lot of work, 
we have uh, today, you'll note by the thumbnail, obviously, you've already clicked on it, you know, we are going to talk about um, a cool little care package that I got from the people over at Lynn Vander Studios. Um, the, my, my friends over at Lynn Vander, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of history of how I got connected with them, uh, and then we're going to dive into their fun little care package that they sent me and talk a little bit about my uh, the, the Kickstarter that we have going on over at uh over with them uh, because there are some amazing amazing people working on a an, just an unbelievable um just an unbelievable project that i i got tossed in it and so it, i i won't lie it is um It was unexpected to be a part of it, um, and it, you, know, you back it up a year and a half or so ago, and it even it even becomes more of a more of a sordid tale on how we got there. Uh, so there is a, an existing book called *The Legacy of Mana* by Lynn Vander Studios. Um, we're gonna page through that here in a minute. Uh, because it's a big, it's a big, it's a big tome. I mean, like it's a, it's, it's a, it's a setting book. It's so, it's definitely sizable, and uh, it is a D and D five E adjacent world, as far as like uh, the it's its own world setting, obviously. Um, but it is it runs off a D and D five E with some heavy modification for the various classes and races and, and special things. And we'll, we'll, we'll get into that, you know, some of that mechanical stuff here in a minute. But I'm going to tell you a story. I'm going to spin you a tale uh, of how this came to be, uh, of how my involvement with the, the project came to be, and uh, more important, how I how these guys became uh, some of my, my uh, like, some of the people that I am most happy to see when I go to conventions now. They, 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 be, they, have, they have become part of my convention family, or I theirs. Um, it, uh, it, all, it all started uh, back before GameholeCon 2022. I need to take a sip, and I'm hoping this isn't loud, so I'm going to open it under the desk so it's not in the microphone, because nobody wants to hear uh, a soda bottle, you know, hissing in their, in their ear. So... The um, uh, right before Game Hole 2022, Game Hole Con, um, I get a message from uh, from a gentleman named Tommy Gofton, one of the uh, owners creators of Lynn Vander Studios, and uh, one of the uh, uh, owners creators managers of D6 Sides of Gaming, uh, who which does a lot of videos and a lot of uh, you know, YouTube shorts and things like that. They're, they're awesome. You absolutely should check them out. Uh, and I got to work with Tommy and D6, um, or, and, uh, uh, Tommy and Six Sides at, uh, GaryCon, I think, the year before, briefly, because I did an Actoroki thing with, uh, the world of Caldea and Peter Atkinson. And they were running the, the camera stuff. So I so I, I got a chance to to meet them a little bit and, and work with them and, and whatnot, and I think that's how I ended up on their radar. Uh, but so I get this message from Tommy Gofton that says, "Hey, we're going to be recording an official, you know, uh, Canon Universe Shadowrun stream at GamePoleCon. Would you be willing to come and play one of your characters from the novels?" And I said, "Oh my God, that'd be that'd be great." I you know I, I absolutely love being on actual plays, and I love I love getting a chance to to act and and be a, and be a goof. Um, but I also love to get to settle into these these narratives, these characters that I've created. Um, and in the case of Shadowrun, I get to I got to play Hollywood, and Hollywood is my elven gunslinger that I played for years and years and years uh, through in my buddies' games and whatnot. And I have since turned him into. Uh, uh, one of the, some of the supporting cast in, in my novels. 
And so I got a chance to actually play a you know sixth edition version, a sixth world version of Hollywood. Uh, and I had a blast. It was it was amazing. It was fun. I bought props. You know, like it, it was just it was a, it was a great time. And we had so much fun that immediately afterwards we're standing around. You know, the video's over. We had that we had the video shoot. You know, there's always a little bit of time between events and stuff. And we're standing around. We're talking. And uh, uh, the, my 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 beloved uh, uh, fellow designer. Uh, Elisa Teague comes walking in and uh, she comes in and she's like, oh, hey, what are you doing? And we start to talk and she's getting ready to sit down and play some D&D, &D, uh, to play some Legacy of Mana D&D uh, &D in the world of Amoria. And uh, I was like, oh man, that's, you know, what? How, how great is that? How much fun will that be? And Tommy, out of the blue, just looks over at me and goes, do you want to play? You know, he had, he had fun playing with me with uh, with Hollywood and was like, do you, do you want to play? I was like, I don't have a character. I don't, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't ready. I've got nothing going on, but I wasn't ready. You know, like, I don't even have my dice with me. You know, like that, like that kind of thing. And he was like, don't worry about it. We've got characters. You know, we, we've got, you know, baseline template characters. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm sure we can scrape up some dice. And, and I got tossed into this event. And uh, that is where we, where yeah, I'm looking through these, you know, uh, Devin, one of the guys over at Lindvander, um, comes over and, and brings me a stack of characters. And, you know, obviously, you know, because they're trying to show off the stuff from Imaria, it's got a bunch of unique stuff. You know, I see this thing, you know, like there's this, uh, this paladin that, you know, kind of can break time and reality. And I'm like, ooh, that's, that's too much. That's too heavy for me as a rando. Uh, and I start paging through, and then I see this one that says Ursine, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute, anybody who knows me knows that the name of my freelance company is Ursa's Den. That's a that's a thing. And I was like, alright, cool. So I grab this Ursine, and it says that he's a Dreadnought Barbarian, and I'm like, Barbarians, I'm, I can have fun with a Barbarian, but what the hell's a Dreadnought? And I read through the quick description, and it's basically like an armored juggernaut of a character and I'm like so basically I get to be this big strong you know you can't move me uh tank of a bear done 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 and so I grab the character and I sit down and it does not take me long initially I I it took me a few minutes to find the character it took me a couple of sessions to find his voice um but I uh I, I it didn't take me long to realize that a lot of the games that Tommy is involved in, or a lot of the Mario games, a lot of the streaming games, um, they tend to be uh, a, a lot of fun. Like, and I know that sounds stupid because that's the whole point of this, but they tend to be, um, they lean into the fun factor, like funny humor, puns, you know, like it's, you know, we, you're getting the audience to laugh, getting us to laugh. Um, and and so you know, I'm like, all right, you know, if there's anything that I've I've ever you know been happy to do, and that's to entertain a crowd. And so I uh, I leaned in and I, I found I found my character, and his name is Nuggle Honeysbane of the Southwoods Honeysbanes. It's a family name. Um, just this goofy kind of kind of backwoods simple barbarian or uh, simple simple uh, barbarian who. Uh, is an anthropomorphic giant bear, a Nemol is what they're what they're called. The the collective are called Nemols. Uh, he is an Ursine Nemol, and uh, I had I had a ton of fun. I had a blast, and he and the characters started to kind of gel together. And as you know, the stream wrapped up, and I was like, oh my god, I I had so much fun. And I was like, you know, do you mind if I keep the character sheet? I like to you know uh, kind of keep everything that I've had my finger my fingertips on. And he was like, yeah, that's fine. He was like, oh, hey, we've got a slot tomorrow. Do you want to come out and play again? And I'm like, I don't have anything tomorrow. So, yeah, that'd be great. And so I got to come back and I got to play um, with Elisa again, with Tommy again. Uh, and I got to play as Nuggle again. And it, the character gelled even more. Uh, it's it's honestly where I met my friend JD Cash, uh, uh, who now we are we are much closer friends. Um, and it was also if you find video clips of it out in the internet, um, it, it is the infamous uh, 
punching a hamster scene. For those of you who know, you know. If you don't, um, go to uh, Six Sides of Gaming and find anything that has the any of the shorts or the clips that have uh, hamster or punch. And uh, you'll know. You'll see and you'll listen. It is easily the funniest thing that I have ever had to happen on stream. Um... But it was, but we we just had a blast, had a great time, and I le I got to leave. You know, I love Game Hole Con anyway, but I got to leave Game Hole Con, um, with with new friends and a new appreciation of of this world and this setting and this character and 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 the story, the kind of sub stories that we that we were building at the table, and I I walked away and was like, that's amazing. Uh, fast forward a few months, and I get a I get a message from Tommy that says, "Hey, we're going to be at uh, at this show. We would love for you to uh, to come by and play some more. Let's talk. Let's let's do the stuff and the things." And then you know things got in the way. Work work happens. Life happens. You know we all we all run into our various various issues, and eventually we get back to Game Hole Con 2023. And at Game Hole, I uh, I had some panels to do, I had some sessions to run myself. But we knew that we wanted that uh, I wanted to we wanted to play Shadowrun again. Uh, so I got to play as Hollywood again. Um, and uh, then I signed up for at least one. I think it ended up being two. Uh, definitely, definitely one session where I got to, oh, I, I played as Nuggle twice. Yeah. I get to play as Nuggle Honey's Bane twice. Nuggle has turned into kind of my iconic Imerian character in for, for stream purposes. I've got a few other ideas if if Tommy needed me to, but I I like playing the character. In fact, the next time I get to play him on stream, I've got some props. I spent money and, and made props for a streaming character. And it's going to be ridiculous, and people are going to uh, crack up when I put them on. We'll say, um, but either way, uh, I even even if it's just me enjoying myself and enjoying to you know talk to the crowd and and get uh, get people going, and and anytime I get a chance to play with Elisa or Tommy, we have so much fun. Um, but this time around, I also got a chance to to get a game in, uh, get a couple of games in with Keith Baker, and get a couple of uh, get a game in with uh, actually I think two games with Forbeck. Uh, you know, like people who I never get to play with, I was able to do because of Six Sides and because of Imaria. Um, so at the end of uh, one of the one of the things uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, one of the things that they do. Uh, at a lot of these shows uh, that Six Sides does is a divi design a module live. And so basically through Twitch and through the live stream of the audience, they they have um, a handful of, of people interact with the panel or have, have these people interact with a handful of people on the panel to create all of the notes that Devin needs to write a single stream module they do this early in the convention. That way he's got a couple of days to kind of iron it out and figure it out and do all the, you know, tent poles and, and side plots and things. And then on that Sunday, we, uh, or th they, they put out a stream that is playing that module live for the first time. No one's ever seen it before. Doesn't know if it works. And, and every other time up until now, it's always been very comical, very slapstick. The uh, the the audience and the people who are commenting and, and whatnot they uh, come up with some of the craziest stuff that Devin has to put together in this in this in this module. And then at Game Hole Con twenty twenty three, we we got uh, uh, whatever whatever the crew was whoever the the audience was that put this together they put us through a meat grinder uh, it was the first time i've had to deal with legitimate doppelgangers one of the other players was playing as a doppel doppelganger version i get stabbed it was awesome i mean like it was uh uh it was an un it was very very scary and very very tough and we actually had some character deaths uh that luckily you know because it's Imaria and we have money and magic and whatnot, we'll be able to fix these people. Uh, cause I would hate to think that they're gone forever, but 
Um, I mean, like, it was it was really tough. It was a tough adventure, but we had a good time, and we were entertaining, and all the people who had who helped put that module together, they got to see their ideas come to fruition and get thrown at a bunch of, for lack of a better term, professional role players um, to uh, uh, see how we deal with it. It was it was awesome. It was, it was a ton of fun. And if you if you don't get a chance to go to Six Sides and check out some of the videos on demand and some of those clips and things to see what I'm talking about, you are missing out. It's really really a great great uh, a great great setup. Uh, but at the end of the design of module live at Gamehole Con this year, um, they had a Kickstarter getting ready to launch for the Pillars of Power, the companion books for uh, the Legacy of Mana. Imaria uh, world setting. And one of the things that they were doing uh, is uh, the Imarian Knights, or Imarian Knights, uh, which is a, a book filled with a little bit of game stuff, but mostly adventures uh, you know, of varying lengths and insertability into your own worlds and whatnot. And uh, Tommy made a, made a, 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 a comment that you know, they're having all of these great people, all these great industry people, all these uh, industry folk uh, that are putting adventures and, and their own fingerprints into this universe through these books and that they can't and he can't wait to announce it. And and, and it got my it got my head working. And as before I left, I was like, hey, uh, if you need anything, I would love to be a part of this. You know, I love your world. I love your setting. I love you know what you've you know, I love that it's, it's brought so many of my, me and my friends together. Um, I'll, I'd love to give you a hand, and uh, we we you know did a handshake deal on the spot. We worked with the contracts and stuff later, uh, but it was it, it it was I'm going to do something for this Imarian Kickstarter, which brings me to now. Which uh, when this video comes out, I want to say there will be about a week left of the Kickstarter, um, and uh, I'll put the link in the description. But you absolutely absolutely should go check that out. Um, I am going to be sharing page space, the co uh, covers with um, Ed Greenwood, Elisa Teague, uh, Keith Baker, Damian Haas, um, Luke Gygax, uh, B Zelda. God, who else? I know there's there, uh, there's a, there's a, the gra the infographic is massive, but there's a huge number of us that are involved. Um, Mark Mears. God, who, I know there's more, but it's it's it, there's a ton of people that are going to be putting in on this project, and uh, I, I'm really uh, I'm very excited to see the final result, um, because I know what I put in, and I, I I enjoyed what I put together for it, and I'm hoping that uh, everybody else got to you know dip their uh, dip their fingers and their pens in the ink and and come up with some really really cool quality stuff. Um, but all of that aside, uh, it's it's just a really really neat world, and I'm gonna flip through some stuff. But when the Kickstarter launched, I reached out to Devin and Tommy and was like, "Hey, I would love to show my viewers um, just a quick overview of how cool this is and, and a reason why they should go and check out the Kickstarter, or even you know go watch the videos and, or you know all of all of the above, and." Um, I was expecting, you know, the, the response I got initially from Devin was, did you not grab a book when you were at Game Hall? I was like, no, I didn't. You know, I, I never think of just like asking for stuff. I always, you know, later on it's like, oh, hey, you know, um, I don't have a copy of that. It would be great if I could, you know, like that, that sort of thing. And, and so they sent me this wonderful care package, uh, and I was expecting just the original Legacy of Mana book. Uh, what I ended up getting is not only the Legacy of Mana book, which we're going to talk about here in a second, but they sent me this awesome Legacy of Mana Game Master screen, a big four-fold Game Master screen. Dun, dun, dun. It's got the cool, like, shattered glass style that the Legacy of Mana, you know, that's kind of like the shattered reality, the, the, the borders of reality kind of thing. Um... But the actual inside, first, it's done very, very well. That's upside down. It's done in the same kind of format as, like, the D&D, &D, the, the Watsy one. 
but it includes all the things that you think it should include for this is not my normal world. Uh, so we have the conditions, and uh, conditions are always good to have on a, a, on a game master screen because that's the, always the stuff that people need to look up. You know, what is what is quick or what does prone do again? Uh, but it also includes a couple of the conditions that they've done specifically for uh, Imarian games. Um, we have delayed. Uh, so one of the things with Imaria is it's very high magic, very high magic, um, and it also has uh, actual like. Uh, the chronomancy it's got time manipulation kind of interwoven in its story it's very very important so uh, they've got a couple of new uh conditions based off of kind of the manipulation of time uh we've got delayed a uh, delayed creature has their speed reduced by 10 feet on its turn a delayed creature can either use its action or a bonus action but not both a creature that would be able to make multiple attacks as part of the attack action makes one less attack. So that's, it's really cool. Um, and it's a universal thing. And I like the fact the way they worded uh, the creature that would be able to make multiple attacks is a delayed creature can always at least make one attack. And that's and that's so important because otherwise you could find somebody who doesn't have multi-attack or, or a, low, a lower class that that doesn't have, or lower level of a class that doesn't have, you know, multiple strikes yet, and just cripple them. Uh, let's see, what uh, the other one we've got, uh, the other time-based one is uh, Quickened. Uh, a creature that takes the attack action can make one additional weapon attack as part of that action. An uh, also, a creature may take the dash, disengage, hide, or use an object action as a bonus action. So it's just, it's just a neat little, like, you're just... A, you're just faster. It's not quite haste, but you're just a little faster. Uh, and then the last one uh, is almost, I think this has been used as like a monster effect before, but it's called Withered. And it's Withered is any healing a withered creature would receive, magical or otherwise, become temporary hit points rather than restoring regular hit points. And any trait or feature a withered creature uses that causes another creature to make a saving throw has the DC of that saving throw reduced by two. So it's just like a little, a little bit of a, um, it, like it's a, it's a pretty, pretty massive hindrance, but it's not the kind of thing that like, you know, being incapacitated is awful. Being restrained is awful. Being stunned awful you know these are all these are t terrible withered you could almost see as you know I'll, I'll deal with that in between games I'll, or i'll deal with that in between conflicts you know like i'm not going to go out of my way to get rid of withered but it means that you're going to have to carry that status that status around and that's the, those are the conditions that i dig is the stuff that you that aren't just oh well the combat's over doesn't matter anymore you know the things that stay with you uh there's a few new weapon properties uh, we've got, um, so Renic Steel is a, ma is like, kind of like the Imarian version of, uh, Mithril or Adamant. It's, it's its own cool special ma uh, magical, we magical metal. Uh, and then it, they've got, uh, Renic weapons are mana withering. Uh, when a creature is hit by a Renic weapon, it must succeed in a DC 10 constitution save or become withered for a minute. See? Withered. Um, once a creature is removed or otherwise overcome the withered condition inflicted by a Renic weapon, they are immune to it for an hour. So, like, you, you kind of get better, you kind of, kind of get over it and your, your system gets used to it. Um, a spellcaster that touches or holds a Renic weapon is automatically and immediately subject to the withered condition until they release or are otherwise not touching the item. So, basically, Renic is anti-magic. Um, and then, uh, an item with the Renic property... If held against an active magical effect, such as one left by a spell or an enchanted item, for one hour will suppress the effects of that area or item. The suppression can last up to an hour or until the Renic item is no longer touching its affected target, whichever happens first. This can affect spells up to 5th level or magic items up to rare in quality. The Renic item would not be able to do this again for one week. So basically, you could have a, you can have like a, almost like anti-magic handcuffs made out of Renic. Yeah, it's, it's cool. You can see. 
Uh, let's see, other weapon properties. There's uh, we firearms, uh, so they do have black powder firearms in, in, in Mario. Uh, reload, obviously. Misfire weapons with this property have the chance to malfunction during use. Uh, an energy cell. So energy cell would be something that's like maybe an, uh, an artificer's uh, item or something that is from like one of the, the, the hidden cults kind of thing. Uh, you, ca you have a weapon that has the energy property make a ranged attack only if it has already been loaded with an energy cell. So like a blaster, sort of, like a fantasy version. Um, and then everything else through here, uh, we've got all the normal stuff, you know, object hit points, cover, the different coins, how much they're worth, you know, the normal everyday stuff. Um, and then there are, uh, the, on the, this last panel, we have uh, some optional rules. We have the luck roll. Uh, the, a player rolls a d20 and takes note of their roll. Then they roll an, an additional d20 and must roll higher than the, the higher the second time. In an event of rolling the same number on both dice, the player succeeds. Um, so it's basically the just sort of let's see if it, let's see if the the flip of the coin happens. Uh, you know, are you lucky in this instance? And it's it's just a cute little mechanic that. You, if you don't want to have um, skills involved in every single die roll, and you don't want to have all that stuff, then you just, you know, you throw on d20, and you throw another d20. Is it equal to or higher? Yes. Then you were lucky. Whatever that might be at the, what the whatever the game master says that's going to be. Uh, and then the other optional rule is Strands of Destiny. Uh, for a common Destiny game players gain one inspiration per character level up with a maximum number of inspiration points equal to three. Basically allows you to bank your inspiration. Heroic players get to do the same thing, uh, they, except they get one inspiration per game session and can bank up to five. An epic destiny game, they get one inspiration every long rest and can bank up to seven. And for legendary destiny, they gain inspiration points from all of the effects above. So per level up, per session, per long rest, and they can bank up to nine. Uh, it is, it's a way for, if you know that you're trying to do something that's epic and story worthy and you don't want your players to falter all the time and just flub stupid rolls, that's, that's what you do. You set a different destiny level for this particular group. Um... And then the inspiration in Maria, what they can, what you, what they are capable of doing, you can spend inspiration as part of a reaction to cause a reroll for any attack that hits. Uh, you can spend an inspiration as a bonus action to grant advantage to a creature for the next attack roll they make. You can spend an inspiration as a bonus action to grant a creature you touch d8 temporary hit points. Uh, you can spend an action cost as a reaction to add d6 to any failed ability check or saving throw. And then you can also spend inspiration as an action to restore one ability or feature that would be restored on a short or long rest, such as a fighter's second wind or an expended spell slot. This option then cannot be used again until you finish a long rest. So it's basically this version of the... Uh, this version of inspiration is rather than kind of a blanket term that just does, you know, here's, here's advantage or disadvantage. There's a bunch of different things and it's all, it's sort of like all Imarian characters have their own individual, uh, like class feature that is this destiny inspiration. It's really cool. It's a neat, it's a really, really neat stuff. Uh, so before I get into the book, I want to show you something else that they gave me in this, in this, uh, uh, care package. Uh, I got a Lynn Vander medal. It's like full on legit, like a, uh, it's a Lynn Vander coin, which I'm going to put up in the, in the shrine later. I just wanted to show you guys, but they're super high quality. Like they're, they're, it's not cheap by any stretch of the imagination. It's great. Uh, it's got a enameled, enameled inset. It's engraved. That 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 L is is actually engraved. It's not it's not uh, just painted on, uh, but it's very cool. So thank you, thank you guys from the studios who gave you that. Uh, and then I didn't even know this existed. Tommy Tommy needs to get better about telling people all the things they have available. This is the Strands of Destiny novel um, that uh, Tommy at least 
least co-wrote, it's the legacy of Mana um, kind of like story, like the initial story about the the, the kind of the, the 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 Luke Skywalker of of Imaria. Um, so I, I haven't obviously I haven't had a chance to read it yet. Um, so no no opinions there, but it's it's got a cool satin cover, uh, cool art. It's got like it's like the 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 here's the the full stretch. I'm assuming that's going to be the party um, of the people who are fighting in the the, the heroes. Um, yeah, so. Very cool. I cannot wait to actually get a chance to read that. Uh, and then, before we get, let's let's go ahead and take a quick look at the actually actual legacy mana. Um, so I'm not going to go through. I'm going to read the back. Oh, jeez, that's such a great quality. It's got metallic embossed Lindvander Studios in the back. It's awesome. All right, I'm going to read the back, and then we're going to flip through the book real quick uh, because I want to make sure that you guys. Uh, get a general idea of of what this is, what this world entails. So that way, you will get excited and you will run over to that Kickstarter and throw your money down and join us with uh, getting into it. Because obviously, when those Kickstarter books come out, um, I'm going to be doing a, a video on video on them here because I was a part of the project. But also because there are so many cool people that that are in that Kickstarter, it needs to it needs to to soar. It's already funded. Uh, so if you're one of those weirdos that's like, I don't back a Kickstarter unless it's funded. It's funded. You're going to get your stuff. Uh, we just want to be able to go unlock cool stuff. <clears throat> Welcome to the world of Imaria. Legacy of Mana is a 5e compatible setting guide infused with unique mechanic adjacent gameplay that will revitalize how you play Dungeons and Dragons at your gaming table. Our world focuses on mystical new features such as the concept of anti-mana versus mana, chronomancy, anthropomorphic cultures, gunpowder properties, airship technologies, godless realms, and the intense connectivity between manipulating destiny and the promise of fate. Imagine a winged elven monk using chronomantic energies to enter a time dilation stance to dodge a bullet as a goblin desperado rogue invokes uncanny luck to accidentally hit with her slinging repeated flintlocks. Even when she initially missed, Visualize a lupine wolf sorcerer playing with the threads of karmic chance to achieve the greatest of spell manipulations, only to have their magic absorbed by the mana-drinking Renic steel sword of an Iltherian knight. What would happen if an orcish dreadnought barbarian slowly walked up to the wall of a fort and with a mighty swing crumbled it to open a path for her allies, only to have a time-employing two-tailed fox touch the rubble and reverse it back into a wall? You can achieve all of this and so much more within the Veil of Imaria. Grab your dice, record initiative, prepare to have it tampered with by a bard of the College of Time, and get ready for an adventure worthy of time itself. So, yeah. That's that's the, in a nutshell, it's, again, it's just a, a really high fantasy, uh, a really high fantasy setting. But let's go ahead and flip through, and I want to show, oh, jeez, and I also apparently get a map. So this is the world map of Imaria, the various continents, da, 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 da. very cool, I was stuck in the front cover of the book, I didn't even know, I didn't even know. Alright, so we have... Uh, I'm, I'm not going to uh, uh, read everything. I'm going to find some very, very cool stuff. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of flip through and show you the neat things. So here we have uh, good old Low Holt Linvander himself. Uh, that is Tommy's uh, kind of his iconic character, the main the, the, the main fella of the story. Uh, we've got uh, some a bunch of different factions. Uh, we've got the Diamond Skull. They're political criminal leaders. Uh, the Eternal Eclipse secret organization seeking to bring down the Veil. Uh, we've got the Monstrous Militia. They're a group of immensely powerful Sphinx sages able to communicate with each other. Um, 
the uh, Tensire Coalition, uh, made up of the Nemal, the anthropomorphic animals, made up of the Nemal tribes. They came together for survival. Uh, so they're like a union of, hey, stop eating us. Uh, just very, very cool stuff. Uh, magic is obviously very, very big in a world that is fueled by magic. Um, we've got a whole section on daily life. Oh, that's a great piece of art. This, uh, other side, this one. Just, uh, yeah, it really went all out to make the, uh, to, the art in this is really, really good. Um, there's a great cat for the above the peoples of Amaria, that, that, that lineup, that whole giant pile of people, that is all of the various races and sub races, uh, that exist in this. I'm just gonna the the I'm gonna go through obviously all of the regular ones like halflings and dragonborn and that stuff is in here because it is still five e adjacent world. Um, but I'm gonna give you a quick lowdown on the uh, the unique people that are in this book. There are even more that come out with the pillars of power. Uh, the people unique to Legacy of Mana are aerial elves. They live in Lunalia, using feathered wings to soar across the heavens. So literally winged elves. Deep elves d uh, dwell below the surface. Neranians are giant-like people who value strength as much as artistic and scholarly pursuits. Uh, Nemals are bipedal animal folk, thrive in the deep forests and jungles of Tensir. They are as diverse as the animal kingdom itself. Redbeard Dwarves, which I'm going to back it up on Nemals, just as a side note, I got to make a new version of a Nemal for Pillars of Power. So there's another, there's a new Nemal in that one. Uh, Redbeard Dwarves are the only innately magical dwarves in Ameria, with bright red hair and unnatural affinity to fire. Shallow Skin Dwarves ply the open seas like their cousins delve in the earth. Sky-touched are rare, childlike built beings of exceptional magical heritage, traversing the sky realms with their mana-given power. So they're literally like magical beings. Vernderar are a dinosaur-like people who mostly keep to themselves deep beneath the surface, guarding their lands and Amaria's mana well since time immemorial. Uh, so I actually have a really, I have an idea for a, a new subrace of Vernderar. Um, that I didn't get a chance to put in my Pillars of Power submission. Um, so sometime in the future, I'm going to do an adventure or something for Imaria, and uh, it'll have those in there, including a new subclass of Bard. But we'll get back to that later. Uh, and then the Zion Q uh, are enhanced human-like people who lead the majority of the human nations in Imaria. They are divided into lines of descendants, each with their own distinctive innate abilities. So yeah, like there's just a bunch of really, really cool stuff. Uh, let's see, trying to find... Um, here's a, There's a picture of one of those winged elves. One of those sky elves. Um, we have... Let's see. There's a Naranian. There's one of those those giant people. The very cool looking Bardiche in his hand. Uh, oh, here are a couple of versions of the Sky Touched. So there's the there's the the one on this side, which is very almost more realistic, and then there's the little dreamy versions, the little like I, I could see them living in like a Final Fantasy world. Um, just very cool stuff. Uh, and there here is a uh, a, a Vernderar. One of those dinosaur people. So they, not quite dragonborn, not quite like the giant, you know, bulky saurials from, uh, or saurians from Forgotten Realms. Um, and then there's actually another, uh, there's another one in here that wasn't listed that is uh, just, it, it, it blows me off. So the Zion Q are all different. And there's one, the Duisk. You'll note that it looks like a skeleton because it's straight up an undead. Uh, you actually get to play as a, a an intelligent undead Zion Q. 
it's very cool. Very, very cool stuff. Um, the Here's a bunch of pictures of Nemals. Uh, between, you know, whether it's down to, from a rabbit or a fox, all the way up to the Mantidians, uh, or Mantidaeans, the, uh, Mantid people, Squirrely, yeah, just a bunch of, it's, it, again, very, very, very cool stuff. And I, I know I keep saying that, and, and I probably sound like a broken record for the people who are re uh, reading this, but there's, it's just a lot of really awesome stuff. Uh, that they came up with uh, that is inventive and new and brings a very, very fun uh, a fun set of aspects to D&D 5e. Um, so even if you weren't playing in Amaria, obviously you probably would want to because it would make the most sense for what you're using here. Um, but yeah, uh Let's see, what do we have here? Uh, there's the uh, the Eltherian Knights, um, who are basically like uh, anti-magic warriors. So you, like Not like witch hunters, exactly, but like they're designed to be... We, we use Renic Steel. We are against magic. It's very, very cool. Um... We have uh, sages who use, uh, uh, they are born with a touch of the Veil of Destiny. Uh, chronomancers. So in uh, many of the streams that I've been a part of, I almost all, there's almost always at least one, sometimes two or three, uh, chronomancers involved. And chronomancers get to do some very, very unique stuff. Uh, and the more inventive of a player you are to be able to use these things... Chef's guess. Um, let's see what else. We've got a bunch of new spells. Uh, the druid. There is a, a the the new circle for the druids of the circle of vitality. Um, they are uh, uh, they basically are druids of magic rather than necessarily druids of nature. They're druids of the magic entity, the the, the magic force of Imaria. Um, boop, boop, boop. The is a monk that uses uh, that, that manipulates time. Uh, the oath of the ages is uh, a, the, a new paladin oath that is manipulation of time. You, you're getting a getting a getting a, a thing here. Um, there's a ranger that. The ranger path that is all about uh, black powder weaponry, so there would be a great like ranger pirate. Um, and then there's the, the the rogue desperado. I adore this class. Uh, the rogue desperado is uh, they they are the uh, make the make the most better better lucky than good over all things. They make the most out of a bad situation. They actually fail forward into success. They're very, very, very cool. And and I think that it would be an absolute f hilarious character to play them up almost like a D&D &D version of Mr. Bean. Like, just you know, maybe you're smarmy, maybe you're you know, role-playing wise, but I mean like as far as the things just always seem to work out even though it really looks poorly for the person involved. Uh, there's a karmic sorcerer um, who uses basically the strands of fate and destiny to manipulate all their stuff. Uh, warlocks and wizards, you know, we all know how that, you know, that, that stuff's more or less the same. Uh, there's some new feats. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, if I haven't showed you, that's a, uh, that's a, a one of the rabbit nemals. Um... They're remarkably, re remarkably efficient. Um, let's see. Then we get into a chapter on the world. It talks about all the different continents, the different orders. It gets deep into who you might be working with. So, like, there's the vast majority of this book is setting and background and all kinds of great cities and locations and. Uh, you know, here's a new realm. There's a new realm. Uh, just very, very cool stuff. Like, so I'm, I'm, let's see, I'm getting up to page 
trying to see where when it stops being about that and starts getting into like equipment and things. There we go. Uh, on the equipment section or the the fluff section, the the lore. Let's see where where did the rules stop and the lore began. There we go. So all of this in this book, this whole section here, this is all setting information. It's all continents and maps and cities and places and cultures and that's all this. Everything before was rules and character stuff and then everything back here is game mastery things. So we get into uh, the equipment, um, all kinds of great uh, great stuff, new armor. Um, so uh, there's a, a gun vest, basically uh, a vest filled with hol holsters for a, a pistol ear. Um, there's different chitin uh, armors because uh, there's a lot of big insects and and you know the uh, mantidaeans and 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 the sylphids and and all that that you can use the their shells to make armor um and then there's uh the uh leperin tower shield this shield was invented by a leperin legion by the leperin legion leperin are the uh the rabbits i was talking about and it is key to their battle strategy. When targeted by a ranged attack that you can see, you can use your reaction to gain half cover by blocking with this shield. Only small creatures can make use of this, and any creature of medium size or larger uses it as a standard shield. It's basically a special shield that the rabbit people use to duck behind cover. I love it. Uh, we've got different new weapons, uh, obviously a whole bunch of guns, uh, you know, the black powder things, uh, but then there's also the Sunfire Rifle. This is that, remember has those energy pistol things that requires an energy cell? There's a Sunfire Pistol and a Sunfire Rifle that, yeah, they don't do necessarily like, you know, they're, they're, they're good weapons, they're good ranged weapons, but the primary reason why you would take them is that they do radiant damage. Instead of doing piercing or bludgeoning or, or regular, they do radiant damage. So they're excellent for, imagine, imagine having like a... Uh, like an anti like a vampire hunter that uses a sunfire rifle. Be awesome. Um, and then we've got Rennick weapons, uh, and then a whole bunch of adventuring gear, and then of course we get into the magic items. There's always going to be magic items that are special. Uh, let's see, the uh, Identify Magnet, an uncommon wondrous item that requires attunement. It is cursed. When the identify spell or another means of magic identify magic ident item identification is used within thirty feet of the identify magnet, it automatically attunes itself to the creature identifying the item. All attempts to identify then return the result of that the item being identified is the identif ident identify magnet. If this item is discarded in any way before the curse is broken, it will automatically reappear somewhere on the creature that is attuned to it. You basically get it's this block. That, that teleports to someone using Identify or magic, uh, identifying magic, which we mean like detect magic if you use it to, to research into an item. Um, and it then becomes everything that you ever pick up is the Identify magnet. It, it, it blinds identifiers. I, I, it's, uh, I love it. It's adorable. Uh, let's see, what else? Uh, the Monocle of Insith, a, a rare wondrous item. Uh, the, this magic monocle allows its wearer, as an action, to speak a command word and grant ten total minutes of true sight to be shared with any creatures it can see. The recipients of the true sight must be chosen by the wearer, and, is, and each is granted the same duration. For example, if the wielder grants true sight to four different creatures, each of them gains true sight for two and a half minutes in total. This property cannot be used again until the next dawn. It's just, a, it's, I, I love the fact that you're cutting up minutes. You know, you've got 10 creatures, we all get it for one minute. Uh, one creature for 10 minutes. You know, it just, it's awesome. I love it. Uh, let's see, what else, what else? Um, Veil Water uh, is a rare potion. It, you regain 3d4 plus 3 hit points. 
and you gain the benefits of a lesser restoration spell. It's a, it's a mixed potion. It's really, really good. Uh, then there's some new technology for airships, pure Renic, Renic crystals, uh, some supernatural stuff, like uh, you could be in an area that's not as powerful with magic. You can get into an area that is literally mana dead. Um, and there's various tables and rolls that you could do when someone tries to cast a spell in those areas. Um, then some op optional rules like I covered in the Game Master's Guide. Uh, or the the game the game master screen, uh, and then we get into uh, some ships, uh, some airships and stuff, and then the section of new monsters. Uh, they call it a friends and foes because not all of them are monsters. Some of them are just like NPC style things. Uh, but we got Iltherians. Uh, we've got uh, more Iltherians. More Iltherians. We got a Renic Automaton, uh, which is a big scary Renic steel. Golem, basically. Um, it retin, uh, a Renic Titan Craft. Uh, it's a giant version of it. The uh, We have some Sages. We got a Dreamwalker, a Channeler, a Chronomancer. Uh, the Plague. I love this. The Plague, collectively, is called These Are Poisonous Creatures That Have Adapted to the Azure Ecosystem. The Plague arose when a chunk of Ser Serpentica reached the lands of Azure. The plague spread rapidly and sickened the forest, rivers, and parts of the lands. These creatures are known to consume everything in their path and are particularly attracted to luminous beings. Uh, so yeah, they're they're just these like nasty. It's like this anti everything ooze that exists. You could use that. I, you could totally use plague as a, a a environmental bad guy like that. Uh, the Urlogs, they're natural territorial beings who constantly compete for leadership. Uh, they usually dress in the skins of exotic creatures. You've got Scouts and Bone Breakers. Uh, we have the Shimmerfish. Uh, they are the Shimmerfish of Kenbia ride waves of heat from the desert's surface. They're big, like, like heat wave floating sharks kind of thing. They're very cool. Uh, we got a Rot Strider, a Wicker Slate Elemental, a uh, Verdant Growth Elk, which uh, is a part plant? I don't remember. Uh, is an example of Ancelabia's attunement to the natural flow of mana, covered nose to tail in thick, vibrant moss. It's a big, like, plant elk. Uh, a construct made of mana crystals, various veil shades. So, like, uh, undead that live within the Veil of Magic. Uh, the Betwixt Lurkers. Um, they are formed from the concepts of violence, murder, and hunger. Uh, yeah, just so much cool stuff. Uh, Man uh, a Mantidaean Spore Tender. Uh, so basically like a, a, a mantis person that farms fungus. A giant Armagant. Uh, these giant pale white and blue beetles form the might of many Mantidaean dens. They are armed with a large singular horn that splits into two prongs at the end. These prongs can, be, can open and close at extreme speed, allowing the insect to burrow through stone and dirt with ease. They're giant drill beetles, basically. Um, thrum hoofs, they're huge the gazelle-like animals. Uh... There's a few world whales, gargantuans. Uh, they're over 40 feet wide and 300 feet long. Um, they're basically floating islandy type things. Uh, another giganto, gigantic thing, the Megmok, an immense reptilian creature with crests of feathers interspersed with its hardened granite scales. Uh, this is basically their version of a kaiju. Uh, unicorn Wraith, uh, an evil undead unicorn. That's right. Uh, Shatterfolk are glass elemental kind of things. Um, yeah. And then at the very end, we have... The, the book ends with a hand-drawn, like Tommy's original hand-drawn map of the world before it became the... Uh, became the, the cloth or the, the fold out one that I've got and there's actually a cloth version that's in the Kickstarter so if you want to like have it 
have a, have a cloth map of the world. It's very, very cool stuff. Um, and I know I've said that about a billion times. So uh, I just really wanted to point out how great of a world this is uh, and that you should totally go check out the Kickstarter. Go to Six Sides of Gaming uh, and, and watch some of the shorts. Watch some of the hell, watch some of the full videos of us playing of, of collectively the games that have been played in this world to get a feel for it. And then hop in on that Kickstarter. Um, it is, it is, uh, a, a really just a fan, a fantastic host of, of, of talent, you know, all humility aside. Uh, and it, he gathered a lot of very, very cool, um, people to, uh, work in his, in, his, in, in the Lynn Vander Studios setting. And I, I cannot wait to get a chance to play again and to um, uh, to 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 be Nuggle again, or maybe even you know who knows? Maybe I'll I'll take a I'll take a chance and I'll go ahead and run a session sometime. Uh, maybe I'll run one for my friends, or maybe Tommy can talk me into guest GMing uh, an Amaria session at at some point. Either way, uh, that is the the quick overview of. The Legacy of Mana main book uh, that you should totally go check out. Uh, the Pillars of Power um, on Kickstarter, uh, and and just you know have have a have a, 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 a as much fun as we have in it. You can totally have it at your tables. Oh, <laughs> so all of that. I know I'm running over, and I need to, I need to get closed up here here shortly. Uh, but I also forgot uh, when this comes out, it will be uh, a new month. It will be the beginning of December, uh, which means I need to go ahead and name the uh, the comment raffle winner uh, for November, uh, and that would be uh, from one of our lives. Uh, that would be from episode 211, uh, J.P. Westmas. <sighs> so when this goes live, I will uh, send J.P. a message and uh, let him know that he has won the November prize raffle. So congratulations to J.P. Um, thank you, thank you guys for, for listening to me ramble on about this world. Uh, and tell you fun stories of streaming and how I got involved and why you should get involved please go check out that Kickstarter. Um, even if you just throw them a couple of bucks to, to, to bump the algorithm here in this final week, I would really love to see some of those stretch goals get bopped open. Um, if only because I really think that Amaria and Legacy of Mana deserves, uh, it deserves a, a, a spot of foothold in fantasy realms that people want to play in, talk about, get to play in, uh, apart from myself and a handful of others that get to do so on streams. Uh, so without further ado, please be safe, uh, wear a mask uh, in places that you need to, get your shots, wash your hands, all of that, leave every room a little happier than when you got there, and uh, play some games. We'll see you in a week. <laughs>